welcome back. So I would like to, uh, who are participants of this workshop? No, no, uh, not the speakers, just participants. Okay. So, yes, could uh, we meet uh, after the, at the coffee break? So that uh, we discuss about, um, um, yes, this Friday uh, participant presentations. Okay? Okay, thank you. So, uh, I think we are uh, a bit late, so we start uh, with uh, Louis Bettencourt, and um, he's going to talk about urban systems. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Hello. Thanks for coming back from lunch. Uh, so my name is Luis Bettencourt. Um, I'm at the University of Chicago. Like Pablo, I, I'm not sure if I feel homeless. Some days I feel homeless, but some days I feel like I have many homes, like a first home, a second home, a third home. So that's a kind of wealth, I guess. So um, anyway, uh, I'm a physicist by training, so uh, I'm sort of a uh, a grandchild of uh, Abdul Salam, actually, because I did my PhD at Imperial College. So I'm very happy to be here, happier than you can imagine. This is kind of a place of legend. Um, and so I'm enjoying every bit of it. Um, but um, I also got interested in people, which often is a problem if you're a physicist. So, uh, so today's talk will be about the work I do now, uh, which via the Santa Fe Institute, where I was until about five years ago, is now at the University of Chicago. Uh, and it's dedicated mostly to the study of, uh, of the world and the human condition, but also sustainability through the lens of cities. I'll use that only sort of in the second part of my talk. So I put this little video up just to warm us up, but uh, the point is that you know I collect these videos of time lapses of cities. You know which city this is, New York City. Uh, just to tell you how complicated, how complex also these environments are, uh, there are all kinds of things going on. The most salient thing is the movement of people and vehicles, but these are very energy intensive places, as you know. And uh, in some sense, uh, except for like special operations in mining or industry, these are the most energy intensive and resource intensive places that we've ever built. And they take a lot of resources in and have consequences worldwide. So part of the story is about that and how that uh, is what it is and how it's changing. So um, I came to the University of Chicago uh, about five years ago, uh, and the idea was to create this new institute uh, based on, in some sense, an old idea. So I think that's also a nice resonance here for, uh, for the workshop, because um, uh, at the University of Chicago, uh, it's a relatively new university, started at the end of the 19th century, and because it was sort of uh, back then in a place that was new uh, and, and sort of at the margins of scholarship, it needed, it recreated many fields in its own way and created many schools of, uh, of, of this and that in Chicago. And one of the most important schools is a school of uh, urban sociology that became today what we call urban science. But uh, they call themselves the school of human ecology. They saw what they did as human ecology. They saw cities as places where people interact in complex networks. There are resources and information flows and that the, the best metaphor that they had was actually being developed at the same time. Ecology was also a new field at the time. Uh, a, man, a man called Henry Cowles actually imported the term from German into English, and he was a professor of botany, uh, same building I occupy now in my faculty position, and, uh, and he turned uh, the term ecology into English, but at the same time it was adopted by people studying cities. So there's sort of an interesting resonance. And so what we do now is obviously bring a lot of these ideas to the 21st century, which means that we study human societies that are urbanizing, but also that we bring modeling and data and principle theory to understand these very complex environments. So I have a lot of fun because I got to go all over the world and visit uh, uh, amazing places in transformation. And most of the time it's a hopeful experience because you see transformations that very quick in many societies. Transformations that are generating development, human development, I'll tell you more uh, later, but they're also creating, of course, challenges of sustainability. So this is kind of what we do. We can look more at the web page. Um, and part of what I'll tell you today is developed in sort of something that uh, we do, which is to create a, a graduate certificate. So it basically is open to all graduate students across the University of Chicago on urban science. It had to be about urban science because of the, what the institute is, but sustainable development is what's important here. 
And so I've been trying in this context, so I teach sort of the, the, the main class that the students need to take to get the certificate. They also do a project. But part of the problem has been how do we approach this issue of sustainability uh, and, uh, and sort of the kind of systems that we're dealing with in a principled way, in a way that's generative, synthetic, but also um, speaks to processes more than things. And as you know, the field of sustainability is enormous. It has all kinds of normative knowledge, uh, hopes and fears, and all kinds of other issues that uh, make a lot of the work that you end up seeing being quite practical. But it's hard sometimes to, for us to understand this. Sapartha reminded us today uh, whether even when we have sustainable development goals, will they actually be sustainable, for example. You know, how do we understand that in a principled way? So I think they'll be quite resonant with the talks this morning. Okay, so this is usually the starting point of when we talked about sustainability. I think most of you that know uh, uh, a bit of, all, uh, all of you know a lot about history, would know what this picture is. Uh, for those of you who are young, maybe you don't know so much, but this is of course, it, it's, it's uh, often billed as the first picture taken by a human from outside the earth, of the earth, it's a selfie, right? And uh, it's, it's obviously, uh, it's Apollo 8, it's uh, Christmas Eve 1968, just to get you a sense, sort of a Christmas present to the Earth. And of course, the background of this is an immense technological achievement of going to the moon. But the most important thing that this did was, was literally a change of perspective, that it created, it inspired the environmental movement, it made people look at the Earth as, as one, as one environment where we live, and it created really at this time and in the years that followed a preoccupation with global Today we'd call it sustainability and sustainable development, but also a, a lot of what was happening um, in the planet. This is also the year 1968 of peak human population growth. We thought at this time that it's going to be a population bomb, that was the expression, and it was the peak. So it's been coming down ever since, but of course there's a lot of inertia in population. We still may have something like 10 million people worldwide. But the point about showing you this is two things. One is the change in perspective that's so important. It's just a picture. But the other one is that this is too big, right? It's the whole Earth. We don't know what to do, right? What do we do first, <laughs> right? It's too much. Um, and, and, and as long as we keep this perspective in mind, we've not been able to solve the problem. For example, create international or global institutions. We have some, but uh, uh, that can actually solve the problem. So part of what's been happening since, and particularly in the last 20 years, has been what has been called localizing sustainable development, so breaking it down to places and populations in ways that are more actionable, better understood, but also that uh, essentially create, um, create ways in which the problem can be better understood. So a lot of the talk will be about that. So this is just to give you a picture. I'll come back to this picture, but this is a picture that I, uh, I use a lot just as a schematic that what we have in some sense, so a city there in, in yellow in the middle, just, just to put a reference point, but imagine a place with population. And the point is that a lot of the resources, the food, the water, uh, the energy, is usually sourced from the outside, usually, often from natural environments, sometimes from agriculture and so on. And then the waste essentially flow outside as well. So uh, particularly air pollution and carbon but a lot of the other wastes as well, that are plastics and all kinds of things, as we know, that are polluting the world. And as the world developed, as population has grown, as the world urbanized, these flows would be getting worse and worse in the sense of pollution. And so a lot of what people are looking for, and then it's a question whether this is sustainable or feasible even, is something that's more circular, that kind of collapses a lot of these open loop sort of resource inflows and outflows into something that is more managed internally to uh, at a certain scale. And cities in particular want to do a lot of what's sometimes called um, a, a more circular economy. Okay, so I'll, I'll get to that in a moment. So one of the things I want you to remember is this formulation of this, this slide, which uh, was in my title. And this is actually from Dana Meadows. Uh, there's a little bit of overlap between Pablo's talk and mine, which I was happy to see. Uh, I'll tell you more about her in a second, but she was one of the people of the Club of Rome that, uh, that uh, authored this important study around that time uh, of limits to growth. And in a later talk in the 80s, she died recently, she kind of formulated what the laws of sustainable systems should be. So these are, the idea here, like any laws, like the laws of physics or something, is that these are things you cannot avoid. They're necessary, but they may not be sufficient. And uh, if you would like, I always ask, ask, you know, that probably there's at least one missing that I can think of. 
But, um, but the point is that the first law, every renewable resource must be used at or below the rate at which it can uh, regenerate itself, was basically what Partha was showing us in terms of having, uh, basically acquiring a natural resource or something that is consumed by humans at a certain rate with a certain efficiency. So you basically cannot do it, and Pablo is asking, can I consume it below that replacement capacity and what happens? So this is saying this is a necessary law of sustainability. But that's just the first one, okay? The second one and the third one are more or less in the same spirit. They say every non-renewable resource must be used at or below the rate at which a renewable resource can be developed to substitute it. Um, and then every pollution stream, so sort of the outputs, must be emitted at or below the rate at which it can be absorbed or made harmless. So for example, with carbon dioxide and methane, we're not doing this, right? So we're just piling it up in the atmosphere with consequences for changing the climate. Same thing for plastics and so on. Okay, so the point about these first three laws is that they're physical laws. They're basically a way of writing, if you will, if you want to be a physicist like we are here at ICTP, it's basically conservation of mass, conservation of energy uh, of a certain kind, right? Where we take a little bit the ecosystems into consideration, but we really didn't say much about ecosystems, right? We just are saying that there's some production of renewable resources out there by something. The fourth law, so these, these are, you know, according to Zania Meadows, she attributes them to Herman Daly. He was an important sort of person that was writing around this time. Uh, he was one of the founders of uh, a, a subfield of economics called ecological economics, which is a subfield that's not really mainstream in economics, at least not in Chicago where I am. But, but it's very interesting and it deals with some of the things I'll be telling you about today. And the fourth one is really about, so it says something, I'm just gonna read it. Capital stocks and resource flows, so it starts very physical must be equitable distributed and sufficient to generate a good life for every person. And she says, uh, it's really a quote, not equally, but fair. Okay, so this is kind of about people. And it seems like a nice thing to say, right? We should say this. It's about equity. If you look at any sustainable plan, it has equity at center now. But it's not very clear why it's necessary, at least to me it wasn't. So this is often credited, she credits this to Carl Henrik Robert. He's kind of famous in Sweden. He's a Swedish doctor who wrote uh, basically a pamphlet about what sustainability should be in the late 80s, early 90s, and uh, the king of Sweden liked it. And so every kid in Swedish schools learns about the natural step, which is what that was called. And this is partly why Sweden is so tuned into sustainable development has played such an important role. So education matters. But, but Bear in mind these, these four laws, and you know, this is kind of, a, to me, a good way of kind of summarizing a lot of things and coming back to them, as expressed as you can see, they're just verbal. But here's sort of the picture that goes with them, okay? So without the people, just for the first three. So uh, uh, a motto, though, you could print on a t-shirt, maybe you could do it for this workshop, uh, is to, to another SFIer, or at least SFI associate, Harold Morowitz. Uh, great, uh, great researcher, died recently uh, of, of particularly uh, early life and the origins of life and other um, uh, biotic processes. And so it says basically matter cycles, energy flows, okay? So this is a way of saying second law of thermodynamics is essentially energy flows, it's transformed, it goes into heat eventually, but matter cycles, it means that at least for the earth system, we can think of matter as being conserved, right? So it doesn't escape, but, uh, but so it needs to cycle. So, so there's a system, we're gonna put things in that box in a moment. But for now, energy needs to be obtained from the outside, from the sun eventually, but sometimes by the wind and other, other places, of course, fossil fuels. Um, and then materials come in as well, and they get transformed into other materials, sometimes the same material, and they go out. And the point about this is that when they go out, usually they're dealt with to a large extent by nature. So we often call this euphemistically ecological services. But this is one way in which methane is recycled, or CO2 is recycled by plants to some extent, uh, and other things get broken down. So part of the point is to create a system that does this with, with sort of the, the formulations that we, we were describing and that basically close the loop uh, of the circulation of materials and obtains energy in ways that are non-destructive, okay? So that's kind of the first three principles encapsulated in the picture. And so the point is that now you can play this game. If you think that this is a fundamental picture, you can play this game by putting things in the box that are different. So you can put a person, you can put yourself or your household, and think, can I actually bend all these resource flows and close them within my household? And the question is gonna be no, right? There are many things you need to get from the outside, from the inside. Maybe you can produce part of your own energy if you have a big house and solar panels and so on. So there are things you can do, but there are things you cannot do, okay? 
Um, so that's a building or institution. I'm sure your university, I think uh, University of Trieste is thinking about this. You know, to what extent can we do that? Recycle within home, you know, generate energy. What about a business, right? We've heard a little bit from Mealy Coffee and others, right? All businesses are saying they're gonna do some of this, right? Uh, what about a city? So I'll tell you about, a lot about later. Almost every large city on the planet is saying that they're trying to do this. Uh, I'll show you a little bit more specifically how, and of course the nation or the world. So, so what's the right scale to close these loops, right? At the moment we're not closing them often, but so this is part of the question. It's a question of practice to some extent, but it's a question also that's tied to uh, often the physical nature and another, uh, the energy needed and so on of closing these, these gaps. So, uh, so in some sense, part of this idea of localizing sustainable development is that you can think of the world from the point of view of these first three laws of sustainability, about energy and materials, in terms of a decomposition into all the households in the world. If everyone was sustainable, the world would be sustainable. All the cities and settlements, big and small. Or all nations, of course, this is what we'd be trying to do with sustainable development goals and uh, and the UN system is to declare that every nation is going to try to be sustainable. And by doing that, we get a world that's sustainable. Or even some geographic decomposition of the kind that we do, for example, in climate models by having tiles or something. But the point is that there are other things that cut across these, like businesses or governments, that are not actually the sum of governments is not the world, the sum of businesses is not the world. Uh, there are other things besides the businesses, and so they help, and they are uh, cross-cutting. But basically, there's this very important question of practice, which is who's responsible for, you know, circling these materials, recovering them, and so on, and who has the agency to do them, right? At what scale is that bending of the cycle appropriate or feasible? And a lot of what happens, of course, for example, is that businesses try to push their responsibility to consumers, to you. And obviously you cannot do some of those things, right? Because you live in a system. So part of the tug of war here is who's gonna take responsibility and who should take responsibility and how far is the scope of the responsibility at some scale, okay? So I'm gonna come back to this and just give you some examples about how some of these could work quantitatively in terms of just simple models. They're not gonna be exhaustive, they're just illustrations. Okay, so this is the first one, the first law of sustainability and it's more or less what Sir Partha was showing you. It's kind of hidden in a different way. And so what I wrote there was, so you see the boxes, if you like boxes, the whole point now is that we have these feedbacks. We have a renewable resource, R, and we have a consumer, C, which is the system. And the consumer's taking in the resource. It's creating a feedback in terms of reducing the population, typically are the numbers or some quantity of the renewable resource. And the renewable resource is renewable, so it has a certain uh, uh, rate of recovery. So I wrote those two equations. It's a canonical form. What are those equations? Or who can tell me who those equations are? Credit and Prey. Lodica Volterra. Okay, so Volterra, right? Yay, we're in Italy. Okay, very good. So you, so if you are sort of an eco a mathematical ecologist, this is kind of like the first one of the first things you learn. You learn to analyze this, you know the system has oscillations, right? Uh, it's not a very good control in terms of producing these very oscillatory systems. And it was developed, as you know, uh, independently by Lodka and Volterra. Uh, the story of Volterra is that he did it uh, having in mind fisheries in the Adriatic. So wait for the next slide. That'll be a surprise. Maybe for some of you a surprise. But the point is that you can start asking questions about when are these equations stable and therefore you can, um, consume the resource and have it renew itself and when not. So for example, you can ask if consumption rate beta is larger than alpha over C. It's almost what Sapartha was telling you. It's just kind of a little bit different, but it's almost the same equation, the same condition. Then, uh, you know, the system crashes because you're consuming too much relative to the rate of replacement. And so this is, uh, it, it's, um, it's very easy to overconsume when the population gets large because you can see that the parameter it just needs to be greater than zero and it's a parameter greater than zero. So the zone at which you're safe goes down and down and down. Okay, so the alpha is almost the same parameter. You have to put the alpha down if C is going up. Uh, and coexistence possible, but you know, it requires uh, a bunch of considerations. So this was done mostly for fisheries and for other uh, predator prey systems, but I thought I'd look into it because why not, right? So I, uh, this morning actually, forgive me, I was looking a little bit at where this come from. And where did Volterra get the idea uh, exactly? So you may know the story, but if not, this is a great story for your mathematical biology efforts, because 
the, the story is that there was this man, Umberto d'Ancona, who, uh, so Vito Voltaire, of course, is a mathematician, very famous already, very illustrious man already, but um, a problem came to him that Umberto d'Ancona, this guy who was an ecologist, uh, was intrigued by the fluctuations of fish landings in Trieste, right? How good is that? So I didn't know that anyway. Uh, and so, but of course, every great story has several ingredients, right? So every great story has fish, right? I'm Portuguese, so I had to say that. But no, but every great story has love, right? So why did Umberto d'Ancona come to Vita Volterra and so on and stayed and they worked together? It's because Luisa. So Luisa Volterra, you see there in the photo, they married there already. So on the right there, there's Luisa and Umberto and uh, their daughter at this, at this uh, um, at, at the stage, Sylvia, and you got, you know, everyone else. So I think this is a great story. So it's the beginning, in some sense, of, of how we understand uh, sustainable systems. And it all began with the fish of Trieste and the love story. Okay. So you can now go to the other laws of sustainability and elaborate them, right? And I'm, I'm just going to show you that this gets very Baroque, but can be done if you want to pursue this path. You can start continuing to have these very abstract models. They don't have space. They don't have population structure or anything. But you can build boxes now where you can say that it, you're going to have a renewable resource that starts replacing the green one, starts replacing the non-renewable resource. You can write equations for this. This is kind of like you can do it if you know these models. It's just pretty simple. Uh, and this has a certain structure that you can solve for. Okay, so. Um, uh, typically, what these models would do is that, uh, uh, that if you don't replace the non-renewable resource you have, that the system grows and then crashes when it runs out of, of resource. But if you uh, do the substitution fast enough, there's a regime in which you can go on as long as then you obey the first law of sustainability and that you continue to harvest at a rate that is consistent. Okay, And this is like the third law about pollution stream. You add another box that is related to another set of equations, and these, these equations typically have equilibria uh, and, and zones of stability that work well, you know, they make the system sustainable, and other zones where the system is unsustainable. So you can pursue this kind of thing. The whole point here are the feedback loops. It's all about the feedback loops. So those are clear and present, and it's on those time scales that the system is, um, is essentially um, sustainable or unsustainable. So the point is that you cannot just think open loop, you have to think in terms of feedback loops. And, and uh, a lot of the exercises I do with my students always, particularly people that come from social science, is that write me the causal diagram, write me the thing with the boxes so that I can see every time that I can follow uh, arrows that close on themselves, then I have a feedback loop that's either positive or negative that creates good things or bad things. Okay, so this way of thinking is very old and basically is very old from the 1970s and 80s. Uh, and in some sense originated, so this is a very famous book, Jay Forrester, this is the MIT way of thinking of complexity, if you will. And it's really about, this became system dynamics, the first application, which is a happy coincidence, was for cities. And you can see a model there in the same spirit about different quantities, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time explaining, but it has to do essentially of what makes a good city in terms of some aspects of their economies and businesses and, uh, and migration. Okay, and the point is again the same, that some of these feedback loops generate dynamics. Feedback loops always generate typically exponential dynamics that can run away from you, but, uh, but if you have the right sort of feedback loops that stabilize the system in some parameter regimes, the system will go on and produce good things. But you have to know where you are in parameter space. And so this is the part that's the same as Pablo's. Uh, this became then applied to a world model called, uh, this became, uh, essentially the limits to growth model, uh, there was a book, and uh, again, uh, this slide is a little bit busy, but the idea is that uh, the researchers that were trying to do this were trying to build a model of resource consumption for non-renewable resources. And so the idea is that as population grows and takes up the non-renewable resource, at some point, it looks like everything's going well, it will continue to increase, and at some point, it will start collapsing, okay? So, uh, so this, of course, um, this is kind of, the kind of, I didn't show you the more complicated one that Pablo had, but here's a version of it, right? The idea at this point was not that was because of climate, that was because of carbon and environmental degradation or biodiversity loss. It was about non-renewable resources and populations that were too big, right? So what we have today is a bit different, 
but nevertheless, it's the idea that these feedback loops will come and get you. Okay, and if you're interested in this, you know, the wonders of, through the wonders of the internet, these codes have been ported into Python. There are, there are documents online explaining how they work, and you can run your own model of the world and so on, and you can play the parameters and save the world or doom the world or whatever you need to do. So, uh, okay. So, and this has been, been redone. It's always in the press, but basically it seems to show that, uh, for, as I said, for the wrong reasons, but, but it seems that uh, in some sense we're not, um, we're not out of the loop uh, in terms of, of solving this problem. But, but so far what I showed you is the old way of thinking. It's not to say that this is not important, but is in some sense uh, very unspecific, right? We're talking about non-renewable resources anywhere or the whole biosphere or something. But what we've learned so far in the last, you know, whatever, 40 years is really that there's a structure to these complex systems, both ecosystems and human systems. And these structures kind of mediate some of these parameters that you see on the whole and put a lot of structure into them. And, and this is the kind of knowledge that you need to have if you're gonna start addressing the problem in a more feasible way in various locations in a way that adds up and so on. So I want to spend the rest of my talk talking a little bit more about that. So first, before I do that, I'm just gonna show you a couple of things that's scary, okay? That, that just show you like, we don't know what's going on. So this is a common index of biodiversity loss. It's a living planet index. This is from our world in data, which has lots of wonderful data that you can download and so on. This is mostly an account of vertebrates and it monitors certain populations throughout the world. Uh, sort of the people interested in biodiversity and conservation will know about this data set, has many problems. But from Latin America, like, like, like Pablo is, or other people here, or Brazil, uh, they, it looks pretty bad. And it's kind of hard to know exactly why. Uh, it turns out it's mostly because there's a lot of uh, land conversion into pasture, and, and that's being lost. That's a little bit the story of the rainforest, but other places in the world look not so bad. So when you look at land uses, this is again a big aggregate worldwide, but this came up this morning. This is kind of interesting. If you haven't looked at this, it's more or less obvious once you look at it. But, you know, uh, so uh, based on some of the arguments that Pablo is telling you about, uh, somebody like E.O. Wilson has proposed that we should leave half the land mass alone to be wild. So this is the idea of half Earth, that we should keep half the Earth at least uh, natural. So and I think this came up also in, in, in Partha's argument towards the end in one of the Pablo's questions. So when you do sort of just a mapping of land, which we're now doing very well with satellites, you get more or less what I'm showing you here. So you can look sort of the latest few dates, which are at the bottom. And the point is that we're using about half the surface of the earth for various uses that are human driven. Um, you know, what's the biggest problem? You can read it, I'm, I'm not gonna ask you and stop, but it's basically grazing. It's land used for cattle. So if you think that what, you know, if you want to address the first problem first, that would be the first one. Then there's a lot of land also used in agriculture. Uh, and, um, and then, cities, uh, urbanization, the people, the places where people actually live is actually less than 2%. It varies depending on how you count exactly, if you count empty spaces or not, about between 1% and 2%. So cities occupy a very small part of actually the land surface. And most of what we're doing in terms of habitat loss for species, which is the main way in which with satellite data we're actually addressing, trying to estimate biodiversity loss, is really due to land uses, the primary ones being grazing and, and crops. Okay, so, so this is kind of interesting because it starts suggesting, at least in principle, that if we can kind of do what I showed you before, that put everyone in these cities and kind of close the system more such that these cities are not destroying land, you could do a lot of good, right? And you can certainly create a lot of connected ecosystems that can support larger uh, diversity. Okay, this is another one. If you think about why did emissions really go up uh, so fast and so scarily in the last 20 years, it's partly because uh, a lot of countries that didn't develop before are now developing. As you can see from this plot, the main thing is China. China really, uh, you know, it's a country that uh, quickly became, uh, had very fast economic growth, but also became the manufacturing central for, for the world. And so you see that. So what should we be worried? So you see at the same point that uh, the USA or the European Union, even before that, at least uh, according to this data, have been actually reducing their emissions for a while now which is kind of good news. Uh, but as long as India and Africa, which has still not reached the development uh, levels of, of China uh, or other countries are gonna take a trajectory like China's, then we're doomed. 
right? So this is part of the problem, and this is a good place to discuss that, ICTP, because it's an international place, but this is the problem that, in some sense, the, pla the places and the people that were the least guilty of creating the emissions are the ones that have to somehow solve it in a different way, because if they don't, we're all screwed, right? So, so this is part of the problem, and, and so what I want to say now, uh, sort of in the last little while, is that, how much time do I have? Until 50, okay, good. Okay, so one of the aspects that, that we, we, we observe in ecosystems, of course, but we also observe in human systems, is that they're organized spatially, but also functionally, in terms of a certain kind of hierarchy of both energy and information, right? So the familiar one sort of on, on the right here, for me, on the right for you, is, is, is the ecosystems live on this energy flow, right? The energy flow comes mostly from the sun, and then goes to primary producers, which sustain the rest of life, right? We were discussing that this morning. And this then flows through a few other levels of, of, uh, of predation and consumption, and then it gets dissipated away, right? And this also recycles materials. So some ecosystems are more closed than others. Uh, ecosystems like rainforests are very good at closing a lot of material flows. But ecosystems like rivers, for example, don't. They live on the flow. And that's true also of some ocean currents and so on. So there are different kinds of ecosystems in terms of material circulation. But this, this hierarchy is very important. And human intervention sometimes is to destroy a habitat, which destroys everything. Sometimes it's predation like fisheries on some elements uh, along the chain that have different consequences for selection and so on. So this is kind of important to know how you're messing with these systems and what are the consequences for that structure and, and viability. But in human societies, we also have a structure where basically uh, early on, uh, the kind of thing that Pablo is describing, a lot of human settlements were more or less interdependent with their, with their immediate hinterlands, the region around them for food and water. But increasingly, as we have more and more cities in the world urbanized, you now have something that has very large cities with a global footprint and with very complicated uh, flows. So what happens is that these top levels, both the large city and sort of the consumer, actually exert controls back into the system. So this is well known in, in some parts also of, of conservation that often if you don't have predation on the herbivore, you have depletion of the primary producer and the whole system kind of is impoverished. When you have more predation, you actually can have, uh, for example, forests that sustain not just grassland and, and the whole system is more balanced. So there are a bunch of things that happen like this that are interesting. And as you, my point next is gonna be that large cities in particular exert uh, a controlling effect on the entire environment because they're essentially the orchestrators and the facilitators and sometimes the exploiters of resources worldwide. And so by acting on the top, you can actually change, it's one good place to change the structure of the entire flow of systems, okay? Yes? Information or energy, which? So energy is going, being dissipated up. So what I meant to say is that energy is harvested usually in small villages and agricultural communities and flows up uh, and it's consumed in larger cities that are energy poor and, and so on. So the amount of, and there's dissipation along the way. And there's information control that basically is flowing down and there's innovation from the top to learn the bottom to make it do so that energy gets there, okay? This is a simplistic way of saying, but it's very important and actually concern. So a lot of the change in the systems is adaptation in the energy uh, that parts of the system have on other parts of the system such that uh, you know, the system continues to work. And particularly as it gets more complex and these changes get longer, that becomes more and more important. So this is the informational part. And in some sense, this informational part is the news. We kind of known that populations and energy flows this way. But the part about information, whether it is relative to economic growth or what it is in terms of evolution, is really kind of crucial. It's not very available to us. And in some sense, ultimately, this is what biodiversity is, is information in nature about other parts of nature and the environment. Okay, so urbanization is going on, and there were these two dates. I'm gonna go a little faster now. But basically, it looks like this. When we look at the hierarchy in space, this is India, of course, it looks like, you know, you've seen these photos at night, they're very sort of charismatic, but you see these large cities are very bright, and then a bunch of other cities. And this has a structure that's been sort of exploited a long time ago. This structure is not exactly true, but it's known as central place theory. But the idea is that larger cities have larger territories. They actually provide services, but also get materials and so on. 
from larger parts of the world uh, and, and their landscapes. And they exert controlling influences and become markets and become centers of innovation, centers of political organization for larger and larger territories. So when you see an urban hierarchy, you see basically that this is this kind of functional hierarchy of resources flowing up the hierarchy and information flowing down such that the whole system works. Okay? When you look at this in terms of an energy hierarchy, on sort of this is a little complicated, but I'm showing you something about power density, so the amount of energy used per unit time per unit space. Okay, this is typical of these systems. So the power density uh, of cities is quite high. This is for nation states as a kind of data set that Singapore and Hong Kong are sort of the exemplar cities. But you see they have much larger population density and much larger energy consumption uh, per person. So this is power density. And uh, you know, this is kind of an ecological concept that the Odom brothers developed a long time ago that still needs to be better quantified. But in some sense what happens in these systems is that the acceleration of energy use but also of money circulation and exchange increases as you go towards these centers, and it's lower sort of in smaller places. So there's sort of a way in which these systems are organized and controlled. And the whole point is that a lot of sort of the problem of sustainability needs to be addressed using some of these properties. And the point I'm gonna make sort of in, in just the last few minutes is that to go to the centers of control is a good idea. And these centers of control, which are the large cities, are actually places that at an intuitive level, they know that they're doing this. They don't know it with science, you know, they're trying, maybe we're, we're the kind of people telling them that, but in some sense they know they're at the center of these flows. They know they have the innovation, the financial power to change them. They don't always have the full political power to change them. So when you look at these places, I'm gonna, uh, Pablo did a little bit of work for me, so I'm not gonna show you this. What you have is disproportionate energy use and economic production and so forth with population size, which reflects this more uh, connected but more information rich um, uh, networks that larger cities are relative to smaller places and so on. So, but this is kind of from the UN, it's just showing you that even though the world at this point when the slide was made was only about 50% um, uh, urbanized or so, it's, uh, a few years ago, that all these good things and bad things were disproportionately centered in these places. Okay, so these environments also create a lot of, of kind of contradictions, which is a concept I'm not gonna explore too much, but part of the problem is always that when you have development, is this, or you have a sustainability solution, can you actually address these three problems at once? So these three problems are in some sense a uh, reformulation of those four laws of, of, um, of, of sustainability where equity being the fourth becomes important. Okay, so what I'm about to tell you now, this is a quote from Mark Novak, sort of, sort of theoretical ecologist of a sort. He's very interested in problems of collective action and group selection. And the quote, as you can see, is telling you a little bit about, about how is it that we create collective solutions in societies, both in biology, but more importantly now in human society. And ecology and evolution have an answer for this that I don't see reflected in the literature in the social sciences. Surely this is the most important problem in the social sciences, right? It's about social action, right? Social knowledge and social action. But ecology and evolution has its own answer that is sort of latent and it's kind of still not very well developed. So these are examples I explore a lot in my book, which is here, but there's this interesting book by, uh, uh, by David Sloan Wilson about how uh, evolutionary theory and group dynamics actually evolves in a lot of community dynamics and policy, particularly from the bottom up, that actually guide a lot of successful solutions. So if you're interested, these are good sources and this book is interesting. So I'm gonna go through this a little quickly, but the idea is that is to go to a, an environment of population dynamics and selection. So the idea is that populations, so what people do, where they are, and so on, uh, but this could also be about biological types, evolve given some factors that control essentially the growth, the differential growth of different types. And this is basically what uh, we call fitness, but in the social context, we often don't call fitness. This structures the system in different ways. So fitness is a measure of information. I could show you this with information theory, but I'm not going to. But so biodiversity is also information. But the idea is that some types are amplified when they're desirable, when they're doing well, and some are de-amplified and can maybe become extinct. And the idea is that this concept of fitness, written as, as I just wrote, which is the standard way, is decomposable across levels. So you can think about an individual belonging to a family and then belonging to a city, for example, and having basically cost benefits that have to do with their uh, affiliation to each one of these levels, they are different, and that the individual compounds into a global cost-benefit analysis. 
The idea is that joining larger groups is the only way to really create large benefits, but also is subject to exploitation. So this is at the basis of problems of altruism and so on. It's more general and it's part of group dynamics, but it means that humans live in this nesting of identities and affiliations that they need to manage, and this is often managed by politics and other means, but, but this is kind of becomes a lot of a conflict, okay? So the idea is that usually one goes to, to this, to the price equation. If you're interested, I could develop this slowly in a different talk, I'm not gonna do it. But the price equation tells you when something can be amplified by these selective dynamics and how it can be amplified differently at different stages of these group affiliations. Some dynamics, for example, for sustainability has to be a group dynamics. Uh, some dynamics of cost benefit will happen in terms of the effort they put in that's individual. And so you can unpack these equations at different levels and create essentially a way in which the calculation has group dynamics, individual dynamics, and you can ask whether the group dynamics is worth it, whether you get a benefit from it or not in terms of the cost that you have to pay to belong to that in terms of the kind of suppression of freedoms that you have. So there's a beautiful set of resonant ideas that go with that. I'm a big fan of Amartyasen, so he has a book I just finished reading, so I put it here, which is called Identity and Violence, and speaks precisely, it's written after September 11th. It's about Muslim identity mostly, but it's really the idea that um, thing, good things only happen when we are able to exercise, use and exercise collective dynamics. So, um, so the idea is that any problem of collective dynamics has these ingredients. You need to create higher collective payoffs, so it has to be worth it to solve the problem of sustainability. It takes information, it takes fair redistribution of the benefits. So you said until 50, so I have two minutes. Uh, maybe okay. leave time for just a okay. couple of questions. So. I'm just gonna show you a few things. So, uh, so cities are kind of playing this role already. So just uh, let me just show you this and then this. So this is the mayor of London. He just says, you know, nations move aside. Um, cities are measuring a lot of their carbon footprints. There's a certain way they're doing this, which is internal, but not their full influence. And you can see basically cities starting to decouple their carbon emissions from their population and economic growth, such as you see here. But this now comes on the background of standardized data that's being produced worldwide uh, now by hundreds of cities that are doing essentially the same thing because they associate it with themselves. So this is kind of a picture. It's a picture full of interesting things. You see that Milan and Venice are here. They have relatively small footprints. Uh, but there are places like Lagos, Nigeria there that uh, are probably underrepresented in terms of their future energy use, which is still very small per capita, okay? So all these ideas are basically coming from a lot of applications in cities that are now are following their trajectories for uh, wastes and carbon emissions and so on, and try to follow sort of this trajectory of sustainable development goals. So I'll just finish by showing that this kind of wealth is creating and solves a lot of the economic and social problems that we see in societies. And uh, at the same time, we're seeing now a big reversal because with COVID, we've had a big reversal of, of these processes in which people are able to collaborate and work together and be educated and be healthy and so on. So uh, it's really a time of great uncertainty as we go forward, as we can see also with the war in Ukraine and the problem of energy being reversed relative to some of the progress that was achieved. So. I'll just close with this quote. It's by a designer I like a lot and who's been to SFI. I, he's in Chicago, so I just had a pleasure of reconnecting with him. He did some of the graphics for our institute, but uh, he's really a, an interesting mind. And so you can read the quote, but in some sense, the most important thing is, you can also put that on a t-shirt. There's no exterior to our ecology in terms of externalities. In some sense, when we look at the problem of sustainability, we need to think ecologically uh, across scales, but also find a ways for people and, and nature to have agency to solve uh, the, the problem and for it to be worth it. And that may well be the most complicated thing we do. Cities are natural at being able to uh, do some of that, but nevertheless, we're kind of missing sort of a kind of institution, level of agency, and structure of fairness and clarity of signals that allows us to do that. So thank you. Thank you very much. So. That was uh, really a lot of uh, 